Why? It's the most problematic question you can ask because it presumes we've thought about the answer. A special one plus one with psychologist, author and researcher Hugh McKay. Hello, I'm Jane Hutchin. Welcome to the programme. For more than 50 years, he's watched and listened to Australians talk about their thoughts, feelings, fears and sometimes prejudices. From the 1970s until recently, Hugh McKay ran one of the longest social trends surveys, giving a unique perspective on how Australians see things. He's a columnist, novelist and a people watcher extraordinaire. But what worries Hugh McKay now is that we all think we have to be happy. Positive psychology, he says, has gone too far. His latest book is What Makes Us Tick. Hugh McKay, thanks so much for joining One Plus One. Tell me about the Australia that you grew up in. Uh, well, I was born just before World War II broke out, so I was a wartime baby and my early memories uh, were of buses painted in camouflage, uh, and everything scarce, food coupons, all of those things, uh, chocolate I was introduced to after the war. Uh, and then post-war, uh, a childhood in suburban Sydney uh, where the beginning of the post-war boom was starting to become evident. But, but generally speaking, it was a very tranquil uh, kind of period. To be a kid, probably not such a tranquil period to be a woman, because one of the characteristics of Australia in the 50s was it was very much pre-women's liberation. Do you recall incidents like that? Well, I don't recall anything other than that any woman who was a mother who had a job was really strange. That was a very exceptional situation. All the mothers were at home, but no, mothers were people who stayed at home and uh, supported their breadwinning husbands and looked after the kids and, of course, uh, m made the life of the community happen. It wasn't all bad, but it was certainly the case that I was growing up in a world where women were second-class citizens, where they certainly did not... Virtually all the girls I knew, with just one or two exceptions, left school at what was then the intermediate certificate. They left school at 15 to go off and get a job and wait to get married. And there were religious differences too, weren't there? Very strong uh, prejudice, um, not like Christianity and Islam, but Protestant and Catholic. Um, I remember my father talking about one of his childhood occupations, which was throwing stones on Catholics' roofs. Uh, that was in Melbourne, <laughs> where it was even worse. I mean, the, uh, the tensions between Catholics and Protestants much stronger in Melbourne than in Sydney, but very evident in Sydney. I mean, it was... When I was growing up as a, as a teenager, starting to think about girls, it was inconceivable that you would, as a Protestant, that you would go out with a Catholic. And it would have been equally inconceivable for a Catholic girl to have uh, gone on a date with me. What interested you about social research? Because at that time, I presume, there weren't a lot of people wondering what people thought, what political parties mm. thought, what the average Australian thought. Mm. When I left school, I, I, I can still remember at the age of 16 walking out of the school gate for the last time with not the faintest idea of what I would do. So social research wasn't burning in my brain as a great ambition or focus, didn't even know there was such a thing. So I left school completely unaware of what I would do. And I worked in a department store for the school holidays like most other school leavers. Uh, and then my father, uh, said that he'd heard of this new thing called media research and public opinion research and so on. Uh, he thought that might interest young Hugh uh, and he made an appointment for me to be interviewed by one of, I think there are only two or three research companies in Australia at that time. What year are we talking about? 1955. Uh, so my father came with me to my first job interview. That's how it was done in the 50s. <laughs> so I started work at what was then the McNair organisation, subsequently became AC Nielsen, and was immediately hooked. I mean, I had no idea what I was getting into, but I was 
as a kid, always a bit of an outsider, a bit of an observer. Uh, I, I was curious about uh, what made people tick and why people did the things they did. So, in a way, my father uh, got it right. I mean, it was a very astute move on his part. Um, but I was like walking into a fog. I had no idea what, what this was really about. But I was immediately intrigued by it. This, of course, was pre-computers. This was um, public opinion research done with pencils and papers. So what did you do in those early days? How did you research? I was a, I was a clerk in the office, um, processing questionnaires that came in from the field workers. Um, after four years of that, uh, my eyesight was affected and I thought, I don't know whether I want to keep doing this. And I, in fact, took a year out uh, as a school teacher in regional Queensland and then returned to research. I, I was hooked uh, and came to the ABC, in fact, uh, for three years. And it was at the ABC where really I, I discovered uh, the potential for research of a deeper and more interesting kind, not just statistical questionnaire-based surveys, but much more exploratory, experimental, qualitative, diagnostic kind of research. Television was new and we were trying out all kinds of ways of figuring out what the television viewing experience was, sitting with people in their living rooms all night, watching television with them, for example, uh, just to, to try and see how you could find out what was going on in people's minds without asking them direct questions. That, that's when my, that was a breakthrough period for me because it was when I realised that often in social research the best way of finding out what people are thinking is not to ask them and certainly never to ask them why but simply to invite them to talk about the subject, whatever the subject happened to be. We, there's a whole, pos a whole uh, set of possible ways of encouraging people to tell you why without asking them why. Can you tell me more about that? Or I'm interested in what you said about this. Pause, and they'll say something else. Uh, or yes, yes, you know, anything else. Uh, the problem about the word why is, and, and it's an issue for journalists much more because of time pressures, much more than for social researchers who can be much more relaxed about all this. Um, but the issue is if you ask someone, two, two, two things, if you ask someone a question, you'll always get an answer because questions elicit answers. And then once you've asked the question, the cat is out of the bag, you never know whether the answer you're getting is the truth or whether it's something someone would have said if you hadn't asked them that question, or whether the answer is only there because the question was asked. I mean, in the physical sciences, that's called the experimental effect. I mean, you, you may have generated data just because of asking a question. Um, so that's one problem. Uh, but the other problem is if the question is why, you've immediately set up the expectation of some kind of rational explanation. Why implies that there's a reason why I did something, and what if there isn't? Surely, for example, if you ask a politician why they said or did something, you would expect a rational response. Well, politicians are human, um, believe it or not, and I think the... I so think, they're not rational? Well, humans aren't. I think the proposition that we are rational, homo sapiens, you know, this is a bit of a misnomer. The proposition that we're rational creatures, I think, is, is very uh, cruel, uh, very insensitive to the truth. The truth is that we are rational and irrational and that we are largely driven by our emotions. The idea that the human brain is like a computer is a really misleading idea. I mean, the human brain is washed with hormones. You know, there's nothing to do with the way a computer functions. It's a completely different kind of instrument or organ. Uh, so I, I think it makes more sense to say humans are non-rational creatures who occasionally behave rationally. 